Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Autoantibodies as Biomarkers in Immuno-Oncology. This webinar is a part of the fifth annual Drug Discovery and Development Virtual Conference. I am Marie Stone of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Luminex, a diasoran company. For more information about Luminex, a diasoran company, go to www.luminexcorp.com. Now let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to first participate by communicating with other attendees using our new live chat feature during the presentation. You can find the live chat located at the right of your screen. You can also participate by submitting as many questions as you would like during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Help Desk button located at the bottom of your screen within the navigation bar or from the lobby. Finally, as a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Click on the Continuing Education Credits link located in the abstract window below the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Hans Dieter Zuck, PhD, Chief Technical Officer, Oncommune Germany, GmbH. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the left of your screen. Hans Dieter, you may now begin your presentation. So thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, uh, depending on where you are located. So today's talk will be covering a topic about autoantibodies as biomarkers in immuno-oncology. And just let's clarify uh, the notion of autoantibodies or tumor-associated antibodies is somehow uh, used in, in different domains in medical science differently. Autoantibodies is more uh, used in the rheumatology field and, and, and you all know cancer uh, uh, tumor-associated antigens more in the cancer field here. So it's actually what are the expected uh, developments, especially in uh, uh, cancer research and the need for biomarkers, which we do see right now. So it's actually, we will have an increased demand in safety studies. Uh, for cancer immunotherapies uh, as immunotherapies are moving to an earlier stage in cancer treatment and require rigid safety monitoring. And hopefully after this uh, end of the uh, corona pandemic, so there will be um, a ramp up, a revival of clinical trials in cancer. And we will also, and that's actually what to be expected, are to address core challenges in uh, uh, checkpoint inhibitory therapy, uh, which, which are, for example, response, non-response topics or topics around adverse reactions. We're facing currently and seeing a lot of uh, um, studies going on trying to, uh, to establish combination, ther combination therapies, CPI combinations with other modalities, and one element is uh, bifunctional antibodies. So B cells, uh, so anybody in cancer, usually we are speaking about T cell biology. So actually I want to uh, break into the B cell uh, here. Also B cells play a role. So it's actually you have these immunomodulatory aspects. Uh, B cells, of course, can also uh, support and, and inhibit tumor development. We have, um, as I mentioned already, tumor-associated uh, uh, antibodies with NK cell combination. And B cells are promoting tumor development and might explain response or non-response phenomena. And switching to the next, element is actually what are autoantibodies or tumor associated antibodies bringing to this equation in total and on the right hand side you see 
that antibodies participate in, I have so many roles, so they can uh, participate in this um, uh, biological processes by blocking receptors or interacting with receptors, by uh, attacking the cell, of course. And all in all, we will have, and we have to consider that the immune system is a fine balance, which is uh, illustrated here with this balance. And this is also important to recognize that with the um, use of CPI treatment and other um, treatments which stimulate the immune system, where, where the immune system is actually treated uh, in the context of cancer, that this balance is a balance uh, which can also go into some negative areas where overstimulation uh, can be harmful or lead to destruction of uh, structures which are essential and in, uh, in the physiology here. So this is definitely one of the problematic uh, squares, I would say. Immunotherapies work, but they are sometimes limited to a minority of patients. And it would be really good to understand um, how this can be extended uh, and how the non-responder rate especially can be maybe uh, found out to uh, to uh, counter, to be countered. And I, I mentioned already the activation of autoreactivity is something which also limits the application sometimes. And this, these are the two application fields which we want to address as a biomarker uh, company uh, looking into trials and looking into patients, what happens and what goes on. So autoantibody production in cancer is um, a source of biomarkers. So how does this, is in this uh, uh, sketch here, you see how the antibodies are actually appearing. And this is starting from the left side. We have an altered protein structure, perhaps on the surface. Mutations and defective proteins are exposed on the cell surface, overexpression, breakdown products, and so forth. And these... Um, malformed proteins can appear quite uh, early in the overall malign processes and the immune system recognizes these structures and uh, has then the chance to produce uh, antibodies which are recognizing, for example, uh, and starting recognizing based of these mutational load perhaps. The nice thing basically in investigating antibodies in a blood sample is that Serum and antibodies are very stable. It's a stable analyte. You can draw it easily. You don't need a, a tissue biopsy. It's in, in essence a fairly simple so-called liquid biopsy. And you can even dry it, dry it on a paper disc and then send it around and investigate. And serology, uh, serological responses are really easy to measure with immunoassays. And with this, if we were to to develop models around this about response or non-response or adverse reactions then at the end of the day it is an easy tool which can be easily deployed in practice it does not need a mass spec at the end you just need an instrument uh, 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 you need an ELISA or you can measure this by using luminix instrumentation and so forth so um how is this then, how do we do this and how do we deal with autoimmunity, autoantibodies, tumor-associated antibodies? So you need two ingredients, which you see on this slide, starting on the left-hand side. So one, what you need, of course, is the patients, the patients there which are on the bottom left uh, from patients or studies and groups. And on the top left side, you see that's actually what we, how do we do this? We have uh, a set of proteins, uh, antigens on stock, which we produce recombinantly, or which we are procuring by buying them, or peptides which we synthesize and so forth. So very large antigen repository. And we are using Luminex XMAP technology here. We're coupling the antigens which we have uh, uh, to beads and we are uh, performing a bead-based um, immunoassay, a bead-based array. That's actually in the bottom. It's an, a straightforward um, direct uh, immunoassay here. 
And then uh, we are measuring, and this is the overall beauty of this system, is actually low volume consumption. We can deploy a lot of antigens, uh, running a lot of samples. Uh, this is fairly fairly uh, straightforward to set up and, and do the uh, quality around this. I will come to this later. And what we're doing then is this uh, typical match, uh, uh, extraction of the informative antigen targets. We peel them, we pull them out of, uh, like baits here, if you want so. And we are then creating a feature ranking, looking which which antigens are reacting to the serum samples. So you have the the illustration is here. The red color should guide you through. We have a red antigen and the red antibody. Together, we're hoping that we identify this novel target. And then in cancer, for example, we can focus down and narrow down and create models and, and panels out of these identified antibodies. This is a really uh, superficial nutshell here, but you get the idea. So how, how does this look in the laboratory? On the right hand side, you see instruments which are uh, supportive here. Uh, FlexMath 3D, we have uh, several instruments in our lab which are uh, supporting and giving the readout. And liquid handling robotics is needed for uh, processing the samples and also getting a good reproducibility. All in all, the automation here is key. And on the left-hand side, you see in principle how we do. We couple the uh, antigens to the uh, color-coded beads from Luminex. Here they are uh, bearing different labels of fluorescence, and we, uh, the coupling is done in separate vials. And then uh, we can combine them because the instrument, as working like a flow uh, cytometer, is able to uh, re-establish the uh, coordinate the beat number if you want so to find out which antigen is reacting with the theorem at the, at the end. And this enables multiplexing in a very nice way. So the benefit actually in using Luminex technology is, uh, and this is actually uh, here, true data from comparing uh, repeat, repeatability of a measure. We have here measured uh, on the left hand side, you see uh, an assay which is related to double strand DNA, which we investigated. And here we are comparing data sets obtained in 2017 together with, with data from 2021. And you get the idea. So the repeatability is very high. And also on the right hand side, this is actually uh, a patient, a technical, full technical replicate of a patient sample is also illustrating that the uh, concordance and the repeatability of these measurements is very high. It is, and this is really an advantage uh, over technologies which, for example, use slides or so. Uh, here it is much harder to achieve uh, a high concordance and a low coefficient of variation. So. A technical aspect, but this is an important one. So at Onkimoon, we are not using only uh, libraries which are recombinant libraries, so it's easy. I mentioned already that the coupling of the antigens as baits to pull out the uh, antibodies and tumor associated antibodies is often driven by ideas and hypotheses. And you have to source those proteins, and we are sourcing them from very broad. So we have an own expression library. Uh, here you see a full Orpheum library from Thermo Fisher, but we are also sourcing antigens by uh, buying and, and asking partners to synthesize peptides in large amounts and large sets. So this is a, a interesting uh, in, in many aspects, but also uh, transfected cells on mammalian proteins and so forth. There's a large source of proteins which we can deploy. And it depends on what we want to investigate. For example, I will come to this aspect later. For example, if we are interested in organ-specific toxicity or so, then one would uh, assemble proteins together and, and putting them, for example, out of the shelf to say, I want to have lung-specific or brain-specific antigens or, or, or to um, investigate this particular aspect of toxicity, for example. So in any biomarker work, this funneling uh, is important and to recognize this is basically a work which is true, which holds true for uh, 
work which is done in microarray uh, expression studies, mass spec, or alike. So it's actually you're starting usually with a large number of n uh, of targets attributes uh, in in discovery approaches, and then you'll have to uh, after uh, your prioritization, you will have to write down what you found. So the panels and the arrays and uh, the hits, if you want, so write them down, and this is also what we do in uh, repeated studies. And see here, actually, we're using uh, a branding for this. For example, Zerotech, we we refer to the technology which is at the edge of uh, discovery, and then we are creating panels, um, uh, narrowing them down, high content panels. Um, the amount of antigens we are measuring in these high content panels is is 96 for example which is a good which is a good fit to the one element of uh, multiplexing with the uh, XMAP technology which is then can be done in, in, in a micro tighter plate and it's a very convenient format and then at the end of the day uh, narrowing it farther down depending on how you want really to deploy uh, be it an ELISA or be it uh, uh, that we will have to focus on only a few markers and and calibrate them and measuring them in, in an assay. This is actually this funneling goes according to the rules of medical uh, device development, product development, and uh, for this endpoint, you then use all these regulatory requirements, design goal, design inputs, uh, and design control, which are uh, key in the drill in this ISO 13485 um, um, context where um, when, for example, deployment as an assay or as a medical device where, uh, is the end point of everything. So how do we, so it's actually, I think the next slide gives you an idea about how we assemble the panels we are investigating. And here, this is one slide, one example. Uh, because we have to make choices here. Uh, the autoimmune panel is fueled, what we are using is fueled when we are investigating autoimmunity in, 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 in uh, its core. It's more related to the uh, antigens which we know already, which are, um, uh, how to say, in, in regulatory guidelines, etc., cetera, et cetera. So we have pathways around cytokines, chemokines, interference, and so forth. And when aiming and uh, towards the immune oncology panel, then there are antigens included, like tumor uh, cancer testis antigens, for example, are playing an important role. Uh, but also, there's also an overlap, and you see in, in at the bottom here uh, genes which come, for example, from thyroidism are very um, popular right now because we uh, do see that they are uh, upon stimulation of the immune system reactions against. Thyroidia structures can happen, and and there you see there is an overlap between this, and this is also where we came from. It's actually seeing and learning uh, the different demands from the fields, and we are complementing these antigens here. So here is one uh, panel, for example, which is uh, called SLE panel. Here, it's just giving you the idea how this looks like because this is what was our starting point where we learn to deal with patients. And also on the next slide gives you an idea about how an autoantibody reactivity looks like in a typical fashion in rheuma. So, and this is also true for cancer. This is very same. Um, you have a prevalence, which is a, which is a number um, uh, and a B modal distribution of the reactivity. So it's not every patient having uh, positive reactivity here, and you have to deal with this. It's not a typical clinical chemical analyte which goes, which changes all in all. But you have on, uh, always the positivity of patients stepping up, and what um, the bioinformatics people have to do are actually scraping uh, from this top. Um, edge the patients which are positive for markers, but also exploiting the quantitative information around. Um, so in the next slide you see, this is basically when you are considering in cancer, um, a CPI treatment, for example, you see that different checkpoint uh, um, treatment regimes are affecting, so they are causing different 
organs or organ problems which are involved. You see here in the different uh, in color on the left hand side, anti-PD-1, anti-CDL4, in pink here, skin, liver, lung perhaps, then CTL4, you have a GI um, involvement. That's actually, I will show you later on some examples of data um, um, that, um, for example, colitis is an important problem which can appear, but um, here you see it's different in the organ involvement. And on the next slide, which we are now seeing is actually how we design and investigate this. We're putting, if you want to say exactly uh, those proteins in the panels and and looking for can we find something in brain or in the thyroidia and this is also here you can um, if you have these and that's actually what we're doing at some of those targets which are coming up frequently in our hands like TPO TSHR or anti-insulin uh, um, uh, type uh, so insulin-related uh, antibodies and so forth. And this is the beauty. Actually, the customization of these uh, bead-based arrays allows you to include the antigen which you are, want to look at and to include in your models. So I will just um, pull a few slides for studies which we've done to, to learn and investigate one by one. Here, yeah, one um, observational study which we've done with the uh, National uh, Cancer Center in Heidelberg um, with um, the, uh, Professor Jessica Hassel. In, uh, actually, she was supporting us and uh, we were able to access samples. Um, you see these characteristics from melanoma uh, samples here. It was The question was basically to find out um, what causes or what reasons can be linked to the um, appearance of adverse uh, immune related adverse reactions and we focused uh, in the beginning very much on colitis uh, we were said okay this is one of the key problems we have here and this you see here the combination we wanted to find out what are uh, overlaps what are distinct patterns for example for anti ctl 4 or anti-pd1 uh, therapeutic uh, points and this is basically how I exp so we did this exactly what I explained to you before we used our immune oncology discovery panel and try to, to map the um, IRE that, uh, response behavior to uh, potential antibody candidates so what we found out was basically that exactly you see here this is uh, on the right hand side very tiny but the uh, um, it's a partially squares regression, which is a bioinformatics pattern, where you uh, can look into the uh, all overall multivariate dependency of biomarkers, which are here the black dots and the uh, um, um, so the related clinical variables, which are in red, and the black um, command here give you the idea. So it's actually what we've seen in the study. Uh, really roughly that there is some variance in the data which is related to poor outcome on one but also um, to, which goes together with uh, uh, fewer uh, immune related adverse event and on the other hand side you have these it's actually better outcome with more IRAs and it seems to be that we are seeing here in this projection um, and uh, there actually this balance between perhaps between stimulation and suppression this is in perhaps naive but this is what we were kind of expecting and we were seeing exactly that and the markers related to this here you see them uh, in names some go down some go up and we are and this is basically important to uh, we are doing the autoantibody interpretation also from the perspective of the respective involved gene or protein target and try to find out do we understand the uh, proteins or what is already published and in, uh, in pathway interpretations and it is important to um, remind ourselves that these antibodies which are appearing are in many cases uh, can participate in uh, in the metabolism, which has been shown also recently, if you look into the pandemic results, antibodies against cytokines, interference, and so forth. 
in many occasion in many occasions they are neutralizing and participating so this gives us perhaps ideas around why they are appearing or what happens here and um uh, the pathways make sense and the hazard ratios here so the univariate statistics then at the end give you the hazard ratio so it's possible to look into the individual markers and say okay there are perhaps uh, situation uh, markers which are protective and others which are more stimulating uh, here I want to feature two which one was this MITF I think I have a slide later on this and also gastrin -re releasing peptide which might be how to say um, a link which makes sense in in terms of colitis or so perhaps that um, are some target which is uh, somehow located or regulating uh, gastrointestinal functions is important so what do so it's besides those typical uh, also here you see for example cancer testis antigens uh, mage uh, the mages uh, they are very popular in cancer immunity but what we also see is often that there are antibodies against cytokines and this is basically here in this small sketch you see okay uh, there are this is a knowledge slide if you say to split between pro-tumor and anti-tumoral uh, cytokines and, and signaling molecules and this is basically our current um, so what we see frequently in our data that uh, anti-cytokine antibodies appearing appearing and frequently appearing and which keeps us interested which makes us interested in those to find out can we really uh, invest, uh, learn from this more so what does this really mean in terms of survival perhaps or what does this mean in, in, in terms of regulating biology because this is basically an acquired property see here one example uh, from this melanoma study where you see survival can be linked if you split the uh, values for certain antibodies against those molecules into high and low and stratify the patients accordingly and this is just first data here but we are looking into this deeper and are interested also to find out what what we can learn further on is this a common topic here like this what you see in the middle or uh, like IL-18 or so that survival can might be uh, linked to those antibodies this keeps us interested and enthusiastic which i mentioned already here you see the split if you stratify patients uh anti mitf antibodies are related to colitis uh this is basically how we do see this uh for the event for the time to event onset of iras in melanoma patients and where we see um, we can link it together Okay, so NGRP, I mentioned already, uh, a gastrointestinal peptide also making a difference between uh, patients' groups. So the, uh, so the actually um, measuring cytokines and um, anti-cytokine antibodies is one, the second application area where uh, autoantibody and um, tumor-associated antibody measurement makes or keeps us interested is actually in the investigation of vaccination response so we did this here so you see here vaccination transient in a study which we've uh, uh, got from or where we got patients from the national cancer institute and these are samples from uh, um, uh, prostate cancer patients mrc rpc uh, a study with uh, um, Prostac and Prostac in combination with immuno uh, stimulating immuno uh, checkpoint inhibitor here in combination. Uh, I just want to bring this here, uh, narrow this here that we do see, and this is nicely uh, can be nicely measured and observed. Individual patients are co uh, connected with lines. You see transients after vaccination, and this is then in this context an application which can uh, investigate are there differences in the amount of the immune response and the answer is yes we can see some differences here but we can also see and uh, look into the um, timing and transients and on the next slide i i completely skip into a different realm but 
very similarly, this is actually how vaccination after COVID looks like, very similar. Yeah, You have these onset, you can learn what is the timing and what's the decay uh, here in, in this case. And this is actually where the individual uh, serolo multiplex serological uh, technology works quite nicely. For prostate, back to prostate cancer, what was making us uh, or keeping us in, uh, interested is I mentioned already cytokines, but this is not only uh, re a reaction against cytokines and receptors, but it could also happen that antibodies are forming, which are against essential enzymes. Uh, I don't know how this really works out, how this uh, is forming and presented, but this is actually an example we had in this prostate cancer study uh, uh, linked to survival basically a hit which was really a link to anti ido which was in our interest list on number one and of course you can um, debate about okay can it circulate is it exposed and 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 but it is interesting for us to recognize that uh, these measurements can identify interesting not only diagnostic targets perhaps but also applications where you say okay we can learn something about the metabolism from that um, in this slide, here you see, which was, I think it was a few days ago, uh, presented from urothelial carcinoma, um, receiving immune checkpoint inhibitors investigation, which we've done together with the Dana Faber Institute, and actually seeing that also here again, that autoantibody can be uh, investigated for the progression uh, and uh, creating models out of this. And a single example, this is also from the same study here, I mentioned the thyroidia uh, biology. And here you see, for example, that a pretreatment and a post-treatment sample here, this is two dots just uh, popping up. So the majority of serological responses of, uh, of this patient, of this very patient, stays more or less the same. It's here on this, on a, on a, on a 45 degrees scatter plot, but you see popping out the TPO and TSHR, which are um, which is reactivity against um, uh, thyroidia hormones, which are essential. And this is basically what we want to investigate and see. Is, is there something going on which uh, keeps our attention? Okay, this is all uh, it. The summary slide is the next slide. You see here, actually, hope um, you've seen and learned from the uh, presentation when I summarize this bead-based multiplex protein arrays. This is basically for the application of finding novel ta autoantibody targets, but also for assembling panels uh, and uh, investigating, and this is actually multiplexing, low serum con consumption will, can be deployed and used if you want to as an analytical Swiss knife and tool, uh, and um, the nice thing is actually the uh, that it can be deployed by anybody. Um, then discovery studies yield interesting targets in biology. This is basically what you've seen, and there are detectable. So, so this is actually what we are starting. We are starting with baseline samples, basically. So, of course, what is baseline in this case is pretreatment. And of course, pretreatment samples have already, uh, they underwent already uh, the disease mechanism and everything. That's actually baseline here. Uh, and then from that perspective, later on, we are able to investigate. And we can see antibodies appearing with favorable or non favorable outcomes. And this is basically uh, wh where we want to learn and further narrow down interesting uh, um, targets here. And last but not least, vaccination transients. Uh, seems to be easy, but this is actually interesting. Anybody who has really uh, co combining can also investigate, is there anything hit beyond that uh, very protein, which is probably injected or so, because in certain occasions it happens that the vaccination transients are broader than expected and this is an interesting aspect okay so thank you for your um, attendance and this is was my talk
Thank you, Hans Dieter, for your informative presentation. We will now start the uh, Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. Let's get started. Our first question is, how can autoantibody biomarker findings be developed further? Yeah, this is um, the answer to this question is, uh, I, I think I covered it uh, kind of, because basically when you have the name, which is like a, like a passport number, you have a recipe, and the recipe is basically setting up uh, uh, an ELISA or an essay at your hand, and, and this is one element, of course, and the second is with this recipe, so it's, it's applicable in the field, it does not need a complex instrument, but of course, also from the perspective of investigating biology around, searching around, it's, it's giving you an idea uh, where you can look at and if this fits to your ideas and hypotheses which you have. Great, thank you. And it looks like we have time for one more question. What is the link between an autoantibody and the biological role of the protein target? Yeah, it's a, sometimes it's a, uh, sometimes confusing uh, because actually when you're talking about a certain target's name, uh, it is confusing that we are talking about anti. Yeah, so it's actually um uh one has to be very clear that an antibody against IL whatever IL10 is something and IL10 can be matched together but it is, has to be somehow we are in our cells in the laboratory forgetting this forgetting this but it's really important that we're talking about some a principle against a certain target great actually we have time for one last question um, how are the baseline samples detected in an immunocompromised individual? Um, so basically, so it's actually, uh, we're starting pre-treatment here. This is uh, uh, what baseline uh, mentions, but also uh, the question of immunocompromisation, if this correctly spelled, is actually something which affects then, uh, which, which you can see if you just want to build a classifier between, of course, you do see differences here. So baseline means before treatment then, or uh, otherwise, of course, you need the correct uh, um, comparison group for getting an idea about what was going on in this particular situation. And it can, for example, if you're depleting B cells or, 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 then you definitely see that something is changing and then there are differences. Great. Well, thank you, Hans Dieter. Do you have any final comments for our audience? No, thanks for having me. Uh, it was a pleasure. Hope it was useful. Thank you. Yes, well, thank you again, Hans Dieter, for your time today and your important research. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Luminex, a Diasorin company, for sponsoring today's webinar. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand for two years until February 2024. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.